Welcome to Why Rocks, a BYU Department of Geological Sciences podcast. We are here today with Dr. Josh Lamont. Welcome, Dr. Lamont. Thanks, Randy. Josh, Joshua. Josh. Really? Yeah. yeah. Did you, yeah, my, does, you, does your grandma call you Joshua? Um, no, my grandma's dead. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear it's, that. It's okay. <laughs> no, my mom calls me Joshua. She's okay. the only one. Okay. I've always wanted to be called JJ, but my mom hated acronyms. What was your middle name? James. It still I is. I guess it still is his middle name, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Right. Interesting how that works. <laughs> right. Yeah. James. We should just call him James. JJ. You wanted to be called JJ. I did, but then my mom wouldn't let it fly. Kibosh. She, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> It's all right. As we start this out, we're going to get a little bit of history. But first, if there was one thing that you would tell our studio audience, which is one person, um, that's really, really interesting about you. There are so many unique things about me. <laughs> I knew he was going to say that. <laughs> that it's hard to choose just one. Uh, let's see here. I... About my physical self, okay. uh, we'll start there. I still have my wisdom teeth. All four? All four. Look at, we've got Neanderthal with us right That's here right. on the podcast. I have a large head and a large mouth. Wow. Makes so... chewing up that bark really easy. That's right. Yeah. That's right. All four wisdom teeth. Didn't have to have them taken out. No. Man, I have a big mouth, but I had to have my wisdom teeth taken out. Yeah. Yeah. I just have to, there's like a... There's like a special way to brush your teeth when really? you grab your wisdom. Teeth. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. You got to like close your jaw a little bit. Bachelor's degree right here at BYU. That's right. And where was that at? Um, so I got my bachelor's here at BYU and I was in, in uh, the College of Life Sciences. Life Sciences? I know. I did not start in where I ended. But he has repented. <laughs> That's right. I've, I've gotten wiser. Um, so I got straight, my... Straight to a PhD or a master's no, in between? No, I did a master's in between. So I started here, did my undergrad in environmental science and really focusing on soils. Okay. Uh, and, Dirt. Yeah. Uh, and then I stayed and did a master's here at BYU also um, because the professor that I was doing some undergrad research with was like, hey, if you stay, you can get done more quickly. And so I did. I finished my master's um, in a year and a half. Oh, so nice. it's really not very good. Well, I mean, I'll, you can, I'll give, <laughs> give you a copy and you can decide. I wouldn't understand anything <laughs> in it, Jeff. I wouldn't, no, it, uh, there's no rocks in it. I wouldn't understand. No, it, and that was interesting because it was mostly emissions. So I looked at uh, the nitrogen cycle and okay. how nitrogen is emitted from soils. All right. Yeah. And then I went on and did a PhD. Okay. So I was. Where was your PhD from? At the University of Delaware. Okay. Not a not a highly well known school. No. Why Delaware? So, um, during my graduate work, okay. when I was doing a master's, I realized that I wanted to kind of dive in a little more, do okay. some more molecular level work. Um, because I saw some talks and people were doing some really cool stuff. And I was like, man, I want to do that. And so I talked to one of our seminar presenters and he was like, well, if you want to do this, which was in our molecular level environmental science, geochemistry, he was like, you should go work with this guy, Don Sparks at the University of Delaware, because he's like the leader in the field. And so that's kind of what led me to end up at Delaware. I met Don at some meetings. I like stalked him at the you know, nice. society meetings until I yeah. finally met him. He's a super nice guy. Didn't mind the stalking? No, okay. I think he was pretty used to it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, and then we ended up out at Delaware, which I never expected. <laughs> so when you, were, when you were a freshman at BYU, you weren't thinking, Got to, got to study hard. Got to get to Delaware. Right. No, <laughs> not at all. But I was, I loved it there. It was a great school, great program. Now, does the college take up, you know, most of the, most of Delaware? <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. So Delaware is known as the small wonder. Um, unless you're from like New Jersey, then you call it the small blunder. Um, <laughs> but, but the, uh, but yeah, it's a very small state. There are three that, counties. I hear they're having a carpeted. Delaware. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they could, yeah. Um, but we loved it. You could uh, get to 
lots of places. Yeah. From the New right England's beautiful too. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually so this is most people don't know Delaware is considered the Mid Atlantic. Oh, okay. So it's a little too far south. Yeah. So it's part of the Delmarva Peninsula. Okay. Um, the Delaware Bay right there. So Mike Duray is going to be calling me now to explain to me that Delaware is not in New England. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Delaware okay. Sorry, Mike. Didn't mean to of Pennsylvania. Didn't mean to offend anybody. <laughs> right. Yeah, south of Pennsylvania. So, what did you do your PhD in? What was what was your field of study, your research? So it was environmental geochemistry, um, looking at soil geochemistry. Okay. And I looked at how sea level rise oh, is yeah. going to impact contaminated coastal soils. And so, if you look around the world, where industrial activity has taken place, it's always associated with water, right? Yeah. Because that's how you get uh, your goods in and, in and out. out, transportation, it's cheap, it's easy, you have water available for those industrial processes. Yep, lubrication, cooling. Right. And so now we have rules and regulations that help keep things pretty clean. <sighs> clean Water Act, That's 1974, right. I think. Yeah, somewhere in there. And so those have helped clean things up. The problem is we have a legacy of contamination. Along we this. were naughty. Yeah, and so you look at areas like uh, in Delaware, uh, where it was a hub of commercial activity yeah. around the turn of the 20th century, and they were tanning hides, and they were dealing with steel refining and that sort of thing that didn't have those rules and regulations. Yeah, And so lots of things got spilled, and they're still there because the soil is really good at holding on to things. And when they would spill those things, because there was no legislation, it was like, oh, yay, we spilled it. Now we don't have to haul that drum over here, clear yeah, coal. Yeah, that's right. And so those areas along those coastal regions are contaminated. That's here in the U.S., and you look globally, it's the same yeah. story. You know, and also you think about how many people live along the coast. Like there's 60% of the global population, I think, live within like yeah, 100 miles, miles yeah. or something of... And it, it comes back to supplying transportation, yeah. goods, and ser goods and services. Right. And so you have high populations, uh, lots, lots of, of contamination, and now we're dealing with climate change and the warming of the oceans. And that, when the oceans warm, they get higher also due to thermal expansion of the water and also melting of land ice. That leads to sea level rise. And that means that those areas that have been contaminated but haven't been inundated by oh. the seas, now are dealing with inundation by the seawater. And we don't really yet understand what that means for that historic contamination. So that's what my dissertation work okay. investigated. And um, we were looking specifically at arsenic and looking at how uh, dynamic redox shifts will influence its speciation and mobility. Which would be a good thing to know because arsenic's not necessarily something you find in a multivitamin. No, I sure hope not. <laughs> so is this the point in time, and I have to read this because it's a big word. Is this the point in time when you were using the synchrotron facilities? Yeah. Yeah, so I got introduced to using synchrotrons during my you, PhD. You're going to have to explain just really quickly, like not, not the two-hour version I got, but like, a, <laughs> you know, the one-minute version. Sure. Because I'm sure three people listening right now. Yeah. Um, and maybe there are only three people that are going to listen, but right. they don't know what this is. Yeah. Hi, Mom. Right. Uh, <laughs> oh, he's being very optimistic. <laughs> um, yeah. So a synchrotron facility is they're usually run by like Department of Energy okay. labs. And that's because they're really expensive, but they're also like cutting edge information technology comes out of them. And the way that it works is that they inject electrons, which if anybody knows how to do that, let me know. Um, yeah. <laughs> but then you inject these electrons into this storage ring and you use some really powerful magnets to get them moving and speed them up. And so then they're going super fast near the speed of light. And you do that because when electrons are moving quickly and then they change direction, they release energy. And that energy release can be captured as a beam of light. And that beam of light is what we use at the synchrotron facilities to 
examine our samples, whether it's at geologic media or it's uh, some type of material science that someone's trying to investigate. But you can take that very powerful light, focus it down into like a nanometer scale, and then bombard your sample with all of those photons, which is the form of energy that get released when the electrons change direction. Okay. And that energy hits your sample, excites the inner electrons of your sample, and then you get this signature that you can make sense of and figure out like, okay, well, if we're looking at arsenic per se, is it arsenic three or is it arsenic five, which are different forms of And the arsenic. signature would be different depending upon which isotope it was. Yeah, that's right. So each different, um, in this case, oxidation state or bonding environment has a specific okay. signature that you can see. So you compare like a known standard, something that you know, to your unknown, and then you can narrow it down. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they're super cool facilities. Um, one of the fun parts is getting to ride their trikes around, right? So they're <laughs> they're pretty big, and so if you want to get from one end to the other, so you're inside have, the tunnel, basically. Oh yeah, you're like underground, and it's like when they're not running. It. No, it's oh they're running it. Yeah, while it's running. That because it's not magnetic, like. Yeah, you're not yeah. like in the ring. Okay. So, around the ring, there are a bunch of like little laboratories okay. that they call end stations, where the beam comes into the end station. That's where you put your sample. And then you lock everything in your lead doors, and then you operate it from outside. Gotcha. Of but if you want to get from one end to the other, you use one of their tricycles. If you're at one of the very cool, really fancy ones, right? Where they now they have tricycles so you don't tip over. I mean, <laughs> I think it's so that the, are uncoordinated. I mean, that's true. Um, I think it's actually to make it easier to carry stuff. So it's like a little basket on the yeah, back. Oh, yeah. how cute. Right, super cute. Yeah, like, like you, yeah, using the garden, right. stuff like that. But That'd as grad cool. students at 3 a.m. when oh. you're there. And oh, no, because here's you, a story. You run it, you know, 24 hours a day. Yeah. So you just have races. I was just going to ask, how quickly can you make it around the loop? Right. I, I don't know, but I could do it quicker than you, I bet. <laughs> I'm sure you could. Yeah. Yeah. Although not as quick as I once could. Okay. <laughs> we'll get Steve Nelson in the race and then I'll have a shot at not right. losing. <laughs> so then you finish your PhD mm -hmm. and you don't come to BYU to work in the College of Life Sciences. You instead go out into the real world for a little bit. Well, kind of the real world. <laughs> you had kind of a layover on your way to coming to teach with our in our department. Yeah, I mean, so... As part of my PhD work, I had a fellowship through the Department of Defense, the SMART Fellowship, okay. um, which is a recruitment program that they have to try to bring in people doing interesting work. And so they paid for my dissertation. They gave me a, nice. a, yeah, an assistantship. It was really nice. Your tax dollars at work right here. <laughs> right. Um, and then as part of the program, once you graduate, then you get placed in a lab. And so it was, it's kind of nice because you get uh, your assistantship while you're in grad school and then you have a guaranteed job when you come out. That is really nice. Yeah, super nice. And so I graduated and I started immediately working for the Army Engineer Research and Development Center um, in their environmental laboratory based in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Okay. And I was. That's the only downside then. Yeah, I mean, Vicksburg is not a big, booming metropolis. And it's humid. It is very humid. Yeah. yeah it's Cockroaches. Yeah, cockroaches and uh, fire ants. Ooh, you lost? Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, no. I, yeah, I don't like fire ants. <laughs> no one should like fire ants. <laughs> it's like you look up to heaven and go, why? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's opposition in all things. Yes, I agree with that. Opposition in the grass. Right. <laughs> um. And yeah, so I ended up there. I worked on the soil and sediment geochemistry team, and it was a really interesting work. It was interdisciplinary, so working with um, geologists, hydrologists, uh, lots of engineers, and we worked on all kinds of different projects that the Army was interested in. So if, Army, if the Army's developing uh, something that'll make a bigger boom, then they also have to think about, well, what might be the environmental impacts of this? Oh, okay. So I had no idea that the Army had so much forethought. 
Um, yeah, they do now. Okay, they yeah. do now. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, th but there's some job security there, right? Yeah. You make a big mess, then you got to clean up big mess. Yeah. 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 Um, but it was a it was a fun place to work, and I really enjoyed the work. Uh, we did stuff on explosives. We did stuff on heavy metals, on radionuclides, all at like soil water interfaces, and and still got to go to the synchrotron. So you were still using mm -hmm. the that when you were there. Yeah. Still doing bicycle races. Yeah. Right. Did you play <laughs> the Queen song while you were doing the bicycle races? No. Oh, that's too bad. I know. I that would have been that would have been cool. That's right. How long were you with the army? I was there for a little over four years. What is one of the coolest projects, things that really pops into your your head that you really enjoyed working on while you were with the Army Corps? Um, there are a few. Uh, one that was really unique and that I never expected to work on something like this was working on a project related to the Osprey aircraft. Oh, yeah. So, you know, these are the aircraft that take up Part take helicopter, off. part airplane. That's right. They take off like a helicopter, then they fly like an airplane. Um, and I hear they're really terrible to ride in. So you didn't get to ride in I one. didn't. No, I wasn't. Like, that was above my pay okay. uh, But they were having issues with these aircraft crashing. And we, and we lost soldiers in training wow. exercises where the Osprey would be landing. And as you can imagine, when a very large aircraft is landing like a helicopter. It kicks up lots of dust. And so they, when that happens, they call that a brownout. And sometimes that dust would get pulled into the engine and then resulted in failure of the engine and then a crash of the aircraft. And so we did some work just related to pretty basic like size partitioning and trying to understand like, okay, they had this um, like engine, it was called the EAPS, which is like the engine air particulate separation system. And so they had this system that was supposed to keep all of that out of the intake so that it would still function. And it was built by somebody or designed by somebody who didn't realize that <laughs> not all soils are the same. And this particle size distribution is different. And so we just showed them that, hey, look, you could have more clay in one soil than another. And if that happens, then it's not going to keep out enough. And that's what's leading to it. So anyway, we wrote that. It went to the Army Inspector General. We got like one of his little coins. That was cool. Um, that is cool. I, yeah. I don't know of too many people who've worked on projects like that that literally – have an immediate impact to save somebody's life. Yeah, and that's part of it. And it was, those kind of projects would come up periodically where they would be like, okay, you need to figure this out in six weeks. That's a short turnaround. Right, and so then it's like, okay, people drop what they're working on. And so like our team leader and our division chief, like those were the guys that ended up going to like Hawaii or wherever it was, maybe it was White Sands, but to go and like test and see the things taking off, and and then we wrote up the the report for no, that. Very cool. Yeah, but there are lots of fun and cool things like sampling next to blown up tanks in Alaska, right? Like, um, looking really for cool. that was looking for explosives that were left over after detonation. Very interesting, yeah. dangerous. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> right. So that was the place where we would go and we would have. Uh, soldier escorts. Yes. And they'd be like, okay, you walk where I walk. You don't step to the side. Right. And that's where you walk. Yeah. And so we would go out there and take some of our equipment and take samples and try to figure out if there was anything left in the soil. And in that instance, permafrost, trying to figure out like what the potential impacts were on permafrost of these residual uh, explosive yeah, materials. At what point in this history that we've been talking about, did you go, ooh, I want to work in environmental chemistry? That's a good question. Um, so he says that like he's surprised. <laughs> I, as an undergrad, I realized that in order for me to stay engaged in my coursework, it had to be something that I enjoyed. Okay. Right? Like I, that, that works for me. Yeah. And so that's what led me to look into the different majors that let me be outside. I knew okay. that like 
being outside was where I was happy and um, and being a third grade PE teacher was just not high on the list. Yeah, or? not not high okay. on the list. Although not low on the list. That You're outside. Yeah. Um, but I took a course in, in uh, biodiversity, and that uh, ended up landing me a job eventually, like chasing birds up in uh, the mountains here in Utah as an undergraduate researcher. And Did then, you catch any? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Jumping off four wheelers onto <laughs> sage grouse and You're wrangling kidding. them. You're, no, you're, no, legit. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> when you said you were chasing birds, I'm thinking bird watching, and it was just oh, a no. figure of speech. No, this is like spotlighting birds in the middle of the night. There are on laws their... against birds have rights. They do, but you can also get permits to do this. <laughs> and so, yeah, we that's part of uh, some population recovery programs is that you relocate birds. So would you be like riding on the back of the four wheeler, like oh yeah, crouch, I was the undergrad Spider Man position. <laughs> That's exactly right. I was the undergrad, so they're like, hop on the back, <laughs> and then we're gonna go twenty miles an hour, and you're gonna jump off onto the bird. That explains a lot about. Yeah, that's it. yeah. <laughs> still have the scars. I think I still have cactus stuck in my arm. <laughs> um, There's other places that are worse. Right. <laughs> so I did that for a while. Ended up getting an internship with the Utah Department of Wildlife Resources, and then working for them during a summer up in a cabin in the mountains by myself like sounds really idyllic but what it made me realize was that i wanted to also interact with humans po gotcha yeah. you didn't want to just be the unabomber no I, the I mean of... yeah the birds were great but they didn't offer too much in terms well after of you've tackled them i mean <laughs> right and so i and that's what led me to environmental science okay. because i was because it was like, okay, that's where like humans and the environment come together. Okay. And then I realized that really what the most interesting part of that is, is getting into environmental chemistry and geochemistry because it just affects everything. And, and that's where I started to see the, my coursework really come to life. And, and so that's what kind of pointed me in that direction. And then getting involved with uh, professors doing research, that really helped shape it and shape my trajectory. Okay. Now, with your background and your um, job history, you know, tackling sage grouse, <laughs> right. what led you to apply here for a <laughs> faculty position in the geology department? <laughs> right. I'm So... I did take a couple of courses from the geology department okay. when I was here as a student. Um, what did you take? So I took like in like geology 101. Okay. Um, Remember who you took it I from? I took it from Brooks, Britt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're still here. Yeah, he doesn't remember me at he all, doesn't. of course. No. That's a good sign. But Usually I, you only remember those few yeah, students. Yeah, but I remember writing about the Navajo sandstone okay. and like I really enjoyed that. Um, but I didn't realize like career options right. at that point. And I think lots of students are like that, right? I agree. Um, I really enjoyed it, uh, but didn't see the career options. And then my, the other course that I took was contaminant hydrogeology. Alan Mayo? or Yeah, from Alan okay. and Steve. Okay. So Steve Nelson and Alan were team teaching it. And that actually really influenced my trajectory. So I took that during my master's. And when I took it, I was like, this is what I want to do. Okay. And so that is what pushed me towards doing that kind of work for my PhD. When, when you came to interview, I remember getting your materials and I remember thinking to myself, why are we interviewing this person that <laughs> doesn't have a degree in geology and <laughs> probably can't tell Gabbro from basalt? And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you came to interview and it must have went okay. Yeah, it went all right. here you are in the booth by yeah, the sign. Right, okay. yeah, it worked out okay. Oh yeah. In your research, you deal with some extreme, I'm going to get it right, uh, extreme environments. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. What are some of those? I mean, so deserts, okay. um, coastal zones. Very specific ecosystems. Yeah, because they're really, to me, it's really interesting where you have dynamic changes occurring, whether that is like freeze thaw cycles, like we see in the Arctic, um, or you have. Um, extreme conditions like we see in Antarctica, and we've got a project right now there. And um, or you're looking at like uh, tidal shifts in coastal zones, where 
it's just interesting and unique and there's still discoveries to be made and that's to me what really drives me to okay. those areas tell us about your project in antarctica uh, so we got uh, who's who is we so i've got a graduate student okay. um, rachel wilmore who's working on the project okay. and she's great uh, and then i partnered with byron adams who's in the biology department okay little cross-disciplinary action. Yeah, yeah. And then also we have some colleagues at uh, CU Boulder. Okay. That And so Byron... Nobody and, from Delaware. Nobody from Delaware, no. <laughs> Byron and Noah and Alicia, who are the folks at CU Boulder, they've been doing Antarctic work okay. for a while. And then when I came here, I reached out to Byron um, because I knew he was doing cool work in Antarctica related to soils, but he was looking at like the little nematodes okay. and stuff in it. And I was like, well, hey, if you ever need some help with the soil geochemistry, I'm your guy. And uh, he brought us on and helped we, you know, contribute a little bit to the proposal. And now the proposal is we've got this huge database of samples from this network of researchers that have gone to Antarctica, collected samples, they've stored them. And so now we have like two or three hundred samples from across the whole of the continent that we're using to understand big trends on a continental scale um, for molecular level things. And so looking at the mineralogical trends or looking at the soil um, like anion content, like how much chloride is there and where is it gathering and how is that related to the microbial populations and the things living in these soils. And so it's cool because it's, it is really extreme. Oh yeah. So we have this project with them. It's very cool because they're doing some uh, cutting edge work with some DNA sequencing and that sort of thing. Of the nematodes. Of nematodes and the microbial population. Okay. So Byron is really this like more nematode kind of. You just called him a nematode. Yeah, he's a nematode. Really cool nematode. <laughs> Um, no, you're a nematode. <laughs> and the, yeah, and the other folks working on the microbial populations. And we're just trying to help them make sense of it, right? Okay. Because just like we tend to gather in certain areas as humans, microbes are similar, right? They want to have the right conditions for themselves to be able to thrive. Right. And there wouldn't be a lot of places in Antarctica where they could. No, it's really weird, right? Because it's frozen so much of the time. Yeah, the ice is five kilometers thick. Right, and it is dry. It's Yes. It's weird, right? Because it's like, okay, there's lots of ice, but it, it's, all it's a desert. Yeah. yeah. And so how do these organisms exist? And that's what we're trying to get at is give a little bit of clue into the geochemistry, what impact it has on their existence. Will you ever get to go to Antarctica in that? Uh, not on this project. So part of why this that's project- That's too bad. Yeah. Because all the cool kids have been to Antarctica. <laughs> that's what I hear. Yeah. Um, but we're really- hoping to leverage this into follow-up Okay, work. very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And you could get, you know, your 101 teacher, Brooks involved in that, and go look for dinosaurs because yeah. there's cool dinosaurs sure. in Antarctica. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Right. Here in Utah, which is kind of a desert, do you do stuff in the Great Basin Desert? Yeah, so we have work in Utah Lake, um, and we've been working with the state of Utah to try to better understand what controls the hydrogeochemistry within Utah Lake. Okay. And so, like any lake, it experiences algal blows, right? Like, I grew up in Ohio, and every lake I ever swam in as a kid, I swear I was jumping through algae, right? And now, that algae didn't kill dogs. That's right. <laughs> and so now, because of the cyanobacteria that can release the toxins, that's what creates these harmful algal blooms. And... We're trying to understand how the sediment and water interact and then control how much phosphorus is released because okay. the phosphorus is what those organisms really want. It's the, um, it's the limiting nutrient in the system. And Utah Lake is really unique, right? It's, this, it's got this huge surface area, but it's really shallow. It's a puddle. Yeah. And it's, this, it's cool because it's this remnant of Lake Bonneville, which has this really great geologic history, right, of <laughs> volcanoes and earthquakes and, you know, natural dam failures. And, um, and so it's cool to tr look through that history and try to figure out, like, okay, what's happening now and how can we give information to make management decisions that better serve 
the lake and the population of the state. Okay. Yeah. So your work at Utah Lake is not just an excuse to go out and hang out for a day on the pontoon boat with Kevin Ray. <laughs> I mean, it is an excuse to go <laughs> and hang out with Kevin on the boat. Um, but we usually is Kevin take crazy samples. or is he a safe driver? No, he's good. Okay. Yeah, he's good. I'm the I'm probably one of the you're the weakest link. Weakest links. Yeah. Gotcha. I, there's at one point we went out. This is the, the first summer we had the boat. And I was driving the boat and we had, it was me and Greg Carling. And we had, I think like three or four students, students and Water Kevin skiing. was there. And so, and our boat is not that big. And we had like hundreds of pounds of equipment there for sampling. And I like, was like, oh no, we need to stop here. And I stopped the boat, but I did it quickly. And if you've ever stopped a boat, on the water quickly, you know that the Oops. nose will dive. Well, when you have two huge coolers and four people on the front on a pontoon boat, that means the pontoon boat's going to go under the water. And so I stopped it. The top or the front end dove down. The rear, I could hear the motor going in the air. In the air. And I see Greg Carling pushing the students out of the way to get to the back of the boat. And he's like, I'm going to stay safe. You're going to count um, so, <laughs> so he wasn't trying so much to counterbalance it. He was just trying to stay out of the water. I'm sure it was counterbalancing it. I'm <laughs> sure that's what happened. All but. of the alumni and other faculty, you know, Retired faculty listening to right right now are going, <laughs> they have a boat? Oh, yeah. I mean, you never let a, a geologist buy a boat. The yeah. first thing that we did was put a hole in it. So you bought a boat. The first thing we did was cut a hole in it um, so we could take That's course. why it's a pontoon boat. Yeah, that's right. Because it if we, would have bought a, a we would have bought a hold boat. Right. <laughs> it really defeats the purpose. You wouldn't yeah. have had to worry about stopping short. That's you know? right. Wouldn't yeah. have just been underwater to begin with. Right. Um, but it's it's a lot of fun to be out there. and. Um, it's the best view of Utah Valley. Yeah, is out there from the, the lake. Boat. Yeah, yeah. What's the water skiing like behind that pontoon boat? Um, it is non-existent. Yeah, because what's the horsepower? Sixty-five. Okay. Yeah. So that means that if it's just one person piloting the boat, you can go fourteen miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so the the alumni are feeling a little bit better about yeah, this. Yeah, but if you get when we're fully loaded, it's like we're going eight miles an hour. You can walk that. You can almost swim that yeah. fast, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. So it makes for some long days on the boat. But you just process samples in between. No, it's all it's all good. Yeah, yeah. How does your research play into the greater environmental? What's the word here? The environmental movement that's going on in the country or in the world? Yeah, I, I mean that's a good question. We try to attack projects that can somehow uh, improve safety and human health. Like that's still okay. at the heart of what I do is trying to understand um, like what natural process is being impacted by us. So there's, I guess it's like a two way street, right? So you look at it, how like humans are changing the environment and then also how the environment impacts humans. And so it's back and forth yeah. in that way. And so like in Utah Lake, we're looking at um, how this natural cycle is influencing the safety of the water for the public who are trying to go out and recreate on it. Um, we're working with Rio Tinto um, at Kennecott okay. to do some uh, reclamation at their site. And so there it's trying to improve uh, the stability of the soils uh, so that it can be revegetated, and um, and so it's really about that. It's trying to figure out how we can uh, create answers to questions about like what's the potential risk of this scenario to the public. Let's chat about one of those scenarios for just a minute. Um, the country singer Dolly Parton has a song "Islands in the Stream." Okay, I'll take your word for it. Then there's a I was born on a farm, and the tractors only had AM hey, radios. I've been to Dolly World. I just don't know the song. <laughs> I've never been to Dolly World. But what about the – there's a proposal here in Utah County called Islands in the Lake. <laughs> what oh, are your man. thoughts? Oh, it was a total disaster, just a pipe dream. Yeah. And um, I don't know if people got confused um, or if there was – or if people were being dishonest about like the real uh, root of 
the proposal. Okay. Right. So some dredging the lake to make these items. Yeah, that's right. So they wanted basically for the state to give them this company, this LLC wanted the state to give them the lake, give right. them the lake bottom, and so that they could dredge the lake, create islands sell those islands and that profit would be used to pay for the project and supposedly they thought that if they dredged the lake bed sediment it would clear up the lake um, but what the proposal really showed was they didn't understand the geologic history right they didn't understand that for 10,000 feet below that the current lake bed it's still sediment goo yeah and so it was just, it didn't have foundation, firm foundation in solid science. So they were going to pile up goo on top of goo <laughs> and then build houses on it. Yeah, well, they were going to put the goo in some tubes on okay. top of the goo. Oh, yeah. so the tubes, the yeah, tubes, the of course, tubes, yeah, yeah, the goo tubes. Mm -hmm. And that was going to fix <laughs> the problem of the goo? Yeah, well, and that's where understanding some of these like geochemical processes like redox chemistry, okay. where... You might have something like sulfide, right, that becomes stable under reducing conditions. But then if you stir it up, then it might oxidize and then things change. And it's important that we have people that understand that to be like, hey, no, that's a bad idea because that's going to completely change things. And you just don't understand yet. And so it's really I'm really glad that the state had the wisdom to knock it down Put and the kibosh on yeah. it. Well, and they would have had to have changed major portions of legislation because yeah. the, the water body is property of the state and, mm -hmm. and all water bodies are property of the state and That's right. excluding that one would be interesting. Yeah. yeah. So they made the right call and, you know, there was a, a good group of scientists from throughout the state who got together and helped raise awareness for that. And, um, I think that, to me, it was a, a great example of how improving communication and sharing what we know about the science can influence, you know, decisions rapidly. Tell our listeners a little bit about the new major um, at BYU, the environmental geology major. Yeah, so environmental geology, it's really similar to the geology major. It's just with some more um, options to you know, take a couple more electives that prepare the students more for going into like an environmental consulting, environmental geology program. Okay. Um, so it's nice because it's hand in hand with our geology program, um, but it allows you to get some more of that, you know, environmental implications side of the science. What advice would you have besides taking the environmental geology or being in the environmental geology major for your bachelor's degree, what advice would you have for students coming into the major who are thinking about majoring in environmental? Is just talk to people. Um, and like talking to the upperclassmen, talk to grad students, uh, talk to your professors, right? Like we're not scary. I think some people think. That Sorry, Dr. Nelson's a little <laughs> scary. <laughs> I mean, some people say, I, I had my student tell me yesterday that he's like, oh, no, you, you're scary. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Did you have a mask on no, or something? No, I don't know. He was the same student who was like laughing at me because of my hair. He said my head looked big. So I think yeah. he was just You look kind of like Joey Tribbiani. So. <laughs> but, but talking to professors early on and throughout your you know, education is so valuable. And in our department, we have the opportunity to know every student, right? And we can know every one of our students. They can know each one of us and come and talk to us, get involved with research. And because that changed my career trajectory, right? Was understanding, getting involved with research and seeing what the possibilities are. And to me, that's the best thing that you can do is talk to people, whether it's students, or faculty, or other professionals, and get involved early. Excellent. As we draw to a close, um, JJ, <laughs> when he was an undergraduate here at BYU, maybe even master's degree, was part of the men's chorus. Is that correct? <laughs> 
I, yes, it was during my undergrad. All right. And he has agreed to sing for us today on the podcast, I believe, in German. <laughs> I don't think I officially <laughs> agreed to this, but I'm going to do it just because I, I guess I'm a man. It'll, it'll lower how scary the students yeah. think you are. So this was a, it was just a warm up, right? That uh, I think it was my high school choir teacher, I think. And it was just locken, 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 kommt der Sommer über das Feld, über das Feld, kommt der locken, ha ha ha, locken, über das Feld. Oh, round of applause, so round of applause. <laughs> Yes, yeah. that's uh, the, the first. This is the first first person to sing on the podcast. Yeah, it's probably not actually German, and if it was at one <laughs> yeah. point, I'm sure I didn't sing it in German. Somebody who speaks German is watching the podcast right now, going, "Does he know what he just <laughs> said?" <laughs> right? No, I do not. Hey, this is BYU. Yeah, yeah. So edit it if it's that, please. We have uh, enjoyed our time today with Dr. Josh Lamont from the BYU Department of Geology. And we thank you for tuning in and watching Why Rocks, a BYU Department of Geological Sciences podcast. Mm -hmm.